Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, March 9, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? We have a lot of stuff on the docket today. We have a market that is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. I'm leading with this to address the constant panic emails coming in all day long about the market going back up. So here's the way we're going to lay this out. In corrective phases, we're to expect large swings in both directions. What that means in English is large swings down, followed by rip your face off rallies that I've said many, many times. That's a rally up north, right, in the northern direction, opposite of the one that goes down south, and both are large. The one that goes down is when the market's trying to shove 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. The one going back up is the conveyor belt of pies in the face. It's a short covering rally. It's a short squeeze. It's a lot of the traders that were right on the way down, realizing that the market's going to reverse for a while. They cover They cause other traders to cover who aren't necessarily in the money. Buying begets buying. Panic buying sets in. Hence, you have a short covering rally or a short squeeze. If you're new to this game, and it's not really a game, it's a business. If you're new to this business, get used to this. You're going to see a lot of this. You're going to see a lot more of this. Now, I'm speaking directly to... The traders that are in a panic situation because the market went up. And therefore, here's the reason why. And it's also something that we've talked about here many, many times. I addressed it, I'm sure, within the last week or two. Here it goes again. I realize that a lot of you trade options. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. They're a good tool. But what some of you might not have heard is when I said if you're trading the near-dated options weekly options, two weeks out, even one month out, even six weeks out, you're likely going to lose. Why is that? Because of days like today. It sucks the premium out of your option, and if your option's expiring anytime soon, it's going to be very hard to climb back into a profitable position unless you get a big swing back in the other direction. I'm not saying that will or won't happen, We're just addressing the reason why you don't trade short-dated options. I understand the reason why you did. They're cheaper than longer-dated options. You can buy more, so you think it's a better deal. It's a worse deal. When the market gets into a corrective phase, it's a process. How many times have I said that? It's in the dozens. It's not going to go straight down all at once. It's not going to go back up to new highs all at once. It goes back and forth. We talked about a character change in the market. So here's what I'm referring to. Look what the market was doing in terms of the intraday range from high to low, the size of the candles. Look what it was doing even right up here as it was going higher. All throughout here, you have very few really, really large candles, maybe one out of 10. What do you have here since the market turned? You have a change in character in the market. Why is that? Because we're now seeing large swings in both directions. Do you see how this all goes together? Let's address a potential elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the shenanigans tail candle from today's activity. You can see here where the tail low comes into about the 50 period moving average. Was that the low of today's activity? And the answer is no chance. How can we be so sure of that? Well, I put the number on the board, 381.73. Here's a 10 minute chart. This is the first 10-minute candle of the day ending at 9.40 a.m. There was nowhere near 381.73 at any point during the day. Therefore, it's a shenanigans tail candle. Now, like always when these show up, I get a lot of emails saying, why does this happen? How does this happen? What does it mean? All that stuff. And here's the only thing I can tell you. It shows up on a chart. At some point in the future, we'll probably see the market down or lower than that price. Here's a case in point. This was a shenanigans tail candle. It's still on the chart. Guess what? A couple days later, the market was down there. Do we know when the market's going to be down there? No, we don't. 
We don't use them for anything other than a piece of guidance. If the market is down at that price, we're pretty sure that at some point during the trading day, intraday, that that price is going to become important. They have in the past, and they likely will in the future. 381.73 is today's shenanigan tail low. What's the other elephant in the room, 390.35? That was put up on the board as a potential short in the afternoon for Inside the Numbers members. The market didn't get there, they came up short, so it was a no trade, but that was really the only short that I was willing to put up on the board during today's market meltup. By the way, what did they do today? Just looking at the chart based on the same thing that we discussed day in and day out, what did they do? They ran up to run a test of the next breakdown candle high. What was the high? It was 390.07. What was today's high? It was just short of that, but close, 389.91. They backed off. Doesn't mean they can't get back up there, close above there tomorrow, but generally speaking, on the first run, they're not going to blow through one of these breakdown candle highs. That's just the way the market works the majority of the time. Sometimes they do, but the majority of the time they don't. The norm is that they don't on the first run. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it's an accident or a coincidence that they closed just under the 20 period moving average after trading above it all afternoon. Maybe put that in your pipe and smoke it for a while. How about a little inside the numbers action? We'll circle back to stocks on the move. There is much to talk about there. It was turnaround Tuesday. Wake up really green. They're having an early session jam session. Right out of the chute, six o'clock in the morning or before. Big swings in both directions. I say it every single day. Early thoughts. The market's up a lot in the pre-market. Let's put things in perspective before we get too excited. They're right back where they were Monday morning. That was where they were at the time of that posting. Awareness. What are they, the bulls, trying to do? First, they're trying to get to around 385.80 to 386. Normally, there would be overhead resistance there. Here's a shorter term chart that includes the pre-market activity. Here's the early morning activity, and you can see... 385 and change to 386 was certainly resistance. They finally broke above it, but it was resistance. Resistance doesn't necessarily mean a short. Resistance means what it is. It's resistance. Sometimes it's a short, sometimes it's not. When they eat time off the clock right around a certain number, they're telling you something. What are they telling you? They're telling you they're building energy to go higher. We know all that. Okay. If they have the juice to get through, the prize would be 387, give or take. Now, here's an interesting one. This does not include the pre-market data, but here you see where the market finished. They came back to revisit 387. They certainly got well above it, but they came back to revisit at the end of the day, 387. Do we now think 387 is important? And the answer is yes. We had a beat on 387 early in the morning, but they got significantly above it. 387 wasn't necessarily a short, it was just important at the time. So if a trader was saying, hey, they're pushing above 386, can I ride it up to 387? Maybe I get six, seven, eight, nine, whatever S&P handles out of it. That's a real trade, by the way. And then we had some flip side stuff just in case. You have to be on both sides of the tape in terms of analyzing things all day, every day, because we play umpire calling balls and strikes. Food for thought, 921, again, pre-market still. Yesterday, they tried to get up and recapture the 20-period moving average on the SPY daily chart. They'll likely try it again at some point. So I'm already putting it in your mind that that same 387 and change, that same 387 zone, it's a target, it's where they're going to be going. They have reason to get there. So you understand what they're trying to accomplish. It gives you a different sense of what you think is going on while it's going on, as opposed to being in the dark and guessing and all that other stuff. And we're moving right along. By 932, we had a nice trade on Stitch Fix. They gave 95 cents right out of the chute. That was the max gain right out of the chute. Profit in the pocket. Have a nice day. And by 935... The door cracks open for the SPY for 387. So there's your first hint from me 
they're going to 387 or higher. ACAD had a little bounce before the number, but then they did the deal anyway, just 937 post. Then we have a little tidbit on Bank of America. Nobody should be in the trade. They opened one penny below. We'll get to the charts in this stuff. I'm just reading it because it's on the board. If they were going to do a shakeout operation, this is the 942 post below 385.80. There's a big amount of space below and into the gap left open from Monday night. And by 946, and here comes 387 and then some. One minute later, nice trade on Citigroup. Once again, have a nice day. 387.40 is the spot above on candle closes and there's more numbers higher. Shouldn't be easy to do, can get above it, but closing candles above is in the 20% of the 80-20 rule. So right here I'm saying, Normally, they're not going to be able to get through here on the first run, but if they do, watch out. So they were hanging around, hanging around, so when they start hanging around, they're hinting they want to go higher. Now, we saw where the market was by the end of the day, or we saw where it was intraday near the highs, just short of 390. So here at 10.03, by the way, here's another awareness. The next daily chart breakdown candle high comes in right around 390. Big fat round number. Not saying they're going there, but if this winds up to be a trend day up, keep that in mind. What was it until it turned around? It was a trend day up. Where did they go? 390 minus a few pennies. How you doing? From here, what I urge you to do is pause the video, read the notes, go back to the charts. See what you think you can learn if you were reading this stuff during the trading day. What I want to do is finish out the notes section. If you're at all interested, you will pause the video, you will read the notes, you will do your due diligence and go back and double check the work. If you're not interested, you won't. And then we'll circle back to take a look at the charts from what? From stocks on the move. Why? Because we always do that. We look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Today, we'll take a look at Bank of America, Citigroup, ACAD, and good old Stitch Fix. The other two didn't hit their numbers. They're off the board. They're no trades. We only take trades at the numbers we want, not somebody else's numbers. We're not interested in rogue numbers. First, we're going to start with BAC, not because it was a trade, but because it was a no trade, but there's a takeaway. Here's the takeaway. The number on the board was 36 56. There was a secondary number they never got to, but 3656 was the number. The opening print was 3655, and they went all the way down to make a low of 3581. Now, the second number was not too far from there, and it would have worked out just fine based on what happened. However, it opened below the number. It's off the board for a reason, because that's the market's way of telling us that it's headed for a different number. Remember, we go with Stocks and markets are headed for a destination. If we can identify the destination, it's 90% of the battle. They're going to do one of two things at the destination. They're either going to turn around and run back in the other direction, or they're going to hang out for a cup of coffee and then go to a secondary or another destination. And then a trader that hasn't been here for a while would say, isn't there a third thing? They just blow through the number? No because then that wasn't the destination. That means my destination or my number is wrong. What we're talking about is what stocks do. They're heading to a destination. You have to understand that concept to get the rest of it. How about City? This one hit its number. The number on the board bright and early, $70.18. You can see what happened here. They spiked it by a few pennies, ran back in the other direction. Obviously, they came back to that number so traders that were trying to hold on for the rocket ride might have got stopped out. But this was a nice little pop here. The high was 71 from a $70.18 entry. So they gave the minimum required base hit at a minimum. Here's what we're talking about. The closing price yesterday was 72.22. Not that far away from the entry price, but to me, I saw it in the pre-market. It was a destination. I had a backup destination just in case. The numbers work. ACAD. This one looks like crap, but let me drill down on the chart a little bit. Here's a one minute chart, and you can see here they came up short, bounced away. They came into the number and they did the deal. This is a rally. It's hard to see a rally on this chart, but it's a rally of about 3%. And then you can see at the end of the day, they rally up to finish above the number. 
after spending all day below the number and then rallying up in the last half an hour of the day, the last 15 minutes of the day, you can see here that for some reason they wanted it. Who's they? The market participants. He who holds the majority of the money behind ACAD for one reason or another didn't want the market to close below 2460, in my opinion. About Stitch Fix, five minute chart, you can see here that they came up short of the second number. Below here was $50.11. My number was $49.98 plus shipping and handling. But if you bought the first number, you were rewarded just minutes later. $53.44 is the high. That's over $2. Nice rip on Stitch Fix. That's it. The trade's over. You're done. Maybe you held some. You would have got stopped out either way. That's a profit in your pocket. Treat it as a business. You move it along. Hand you $2. I'm not sure how much more of the position you're going to have on than at most half by that point. What's going on over in Camp IWM? Big day, up about 2%. I want to point down to the volume. We didn't do this on the SPY chart, but just to reiterate, and we did this a couple of days ago, you can see here the highest volume wasn't the low day, meaning the intraday low, but it was this day here, that first day they hit the 50 period moving average, and each day after that has been on decreasing volume. Now, I'm not suggesting that's bullish or bearish. I'm just saying it's not an increasing volume, which would be bullish. Decreasing volume isn't bullish or bearish in and of itself, but when you see a market surging higher, and you see it on tremendous volume, that's institutional participation. Doesn't mean some of the institutions aren't in this move, but you don't have all out buying with the intention of an entirely another leg higher. That's what the institutions would be doing. But in terms of this particular chart, you're above the 20 period moving average. That's a tremendous move. They tested or didn't get quite to the top of, but in the vicinity of, this breakdown candle high, same story as the SPY. And again, we've got the all the same market scenario. If everything is going to get a 2%, 1.5%, 3% lift on the day, then everything is going to get a lift. Rising tide will lift all boats. If everything comes down 1.5%, 2% or more in a particular day, there's no market that's up. And if there is, it's an anomaly. Check out what's going on with the folks down at the transportation department. We're missing yesterday's data. So here's the 9th, that's today. Where's the 8th? It's gone. I don't know what happened. It's a little bit corrupt. I don't mean corrupt in the sense of the whole thing is corrupt. I just mean my data is corrupt. I can't bring up some of the shorter term charts. So for the transports, we're just going to say the same story. They were up big on the day. They didn't finish up big. They only finished up 66 points. That's interesting in and of itself also. One half of 1%. So the IWM, which is my favorite market leading indicator, that was leading to the upside, but the transports were not. So we'll leave it be for now. Maybe a small puzzle piece. I'm not sure it's on the table yet. I think it's still in the lid to the box. What about the folks out in Silicon Valley? This is the one where I did get a lot of questions today. They were up 4%. So people want to know, was that the bottom and all that stuff? Here's where you have to put it in perspective. And we talked about this, I believe, in the weekend video. I said that the Qs or the NASDAQ was down about 10%. That's going to raise some eyebrows. That's also going to add in some buy the dip crowd participants. I didn't say that at the time, but that's what happened. But you have to put this in perspective. Everybody got all wild today with the NASDAQ or the Qs up this much. There's where the high was. Here's where your 10% was, give or take, something in that neighborhood. All we are is up here. They're always going to have garden variety retracements. Sometimes a market from a peak, right? So let's say this is a top. Sometimes you'll retrace about a third. Sometimes they'll retrace about half. Sometimes they'll retrace more than that. Sometimes they make new highs or more than 100% retracement, which means they weren't retracing anything. So here's what we'll say about the retracements. Let's say here's a high. Let's say we're in the midst of a retracement. Let's say they're going to retrace about half. So if they do, this is what happens. They retrace half. 
And then they begin to fail if that's all they're going to do. Let's look back at the chart. Check it out. Where's about half, right? We're not going to make this into a science. Where's this about half? Right about here. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it a coincidence that that spot comes in right around this convergence of the moving averages? You can see here, here's your high, here's your low. That's about half. I don't have to measure it. Maybe they get up to this breakdown candle high. Maybe they spike it. Maybe they get to this one. But do you think that if this is reached, let's say tomorrow or the following day, do you think they're just going to blow through this spot up here? No, not under normal garden variety market conditions. But while they're getting up there and while they're up there, what are traders thinking? Traders are thinking after seeing two or three days of this kind of bullish behavior, traders are thinking, oh shit, I missed the boat again. I got to hop on board. Guess what? You just became Johnny Come Lately. What you just experienced was FOMO. What's FOMO? Fear of missing out. This is what the market does to you. It gives you these emotions. How you handle these emotions separates whether or not you make money in the market or you lose money in the market, period, full stop. XLF, it's like a chop shop formation in the XLF. They were down today. Is it an alarm bell because the XLF was down on a day when the S&P was up? Well, not really because yields seem to turn around finally, at least on a reprieve. So what we've got is the bond market was rallying today for once and the interest rate market was declining today for once. So the whole trade where direct profits right to the bottom line by rising yields for the banks, that story was put on hold today. So the XLF was down. They're well above all the moving averages. Nothing to see here other than the trend is your friend until she throws you out on your ass. What about Smash Mouth? How about up about 6%, almost 13 smokes? Same story as the Qs. It was down tremendous. When the market bounces, you're going to get the bigger bounces from the things that were stretched the most. Think about it as a rubber band. If you have a big, thick rubber band and you stretch it a little bit and you let go of one side or both sides, it doesn't do a whole lot. But if you stretch the rubber band more and more and more, the more you stretch it, the faster it's going to snap back. The market's the same. The short squeeze, the panic buying, whatever it was in the semi-space, right? The semiconductors were absolutely bludgeoned of late. So the snapback, the squeeze, the rally, the panic buying, whatever you want to call it, is that much more pronounced in something like the SMH because it got that much more killed. And by the way, I want to make mention of this. This was no accident or no coincidence. So this close below is a bearish signal. You close below the 100 period moving average. You close below the low from the day before. Now, it turned out to be a fake out and shorting in the hole is not recommended. I talk about that all the time. I'm not saying anybody should have shorted the market when they closed below here yesterday. But what I am saying is that somebody was in tune with this rally when it happened, how it happened, the fact that the SMH closed below here and the next day it's up 6%. That's not an accident or a coincidence. There are people watching the tape. Call it the plunge protection team, conspiracy theory 8.9, whatever you want to call it. Let's talk about gold for a moment. So long-term uptrend was the concept in gold. It still is. 170 was the original buy. And here's what happened at 170. The low was 170.98. I don't remember the exact price, but the market rallied and then it came back down. And once it started hovering around that same spot, it becomes apparent that that wasn't the final destination, but yet they were going lower. Okay, so they went lower. Now here's where we are. Story hasn't changed. Long-term uptrend, still another buying opportunity down here for gold. But that's not the point that I really want to make tonight. We're going to deviate a little bit. GDX. I know a lot of traders like GDX, and a lot of times the mining stocks, whether they're junior miners, gold and silver, major miners, whatever you want to call them, bigger companies, they tend to outperform the metal itself. Specific miners more than others. I'm not getting into the makeup of these companies. You can do the homework for yourself. But here's what I want to mention. So a lot of times GDX will give you a signal 
when gold is bottoming or trying to bottom or trying to make a low. They'll rally it a little bit first a lot of times. It'll stay kind of buoyant, if you will, if I could use that term. It'll stop going down before gold stops going down. It gives you signals. They're not always the same. You just have to be able to recognize that they're starting to diverge a little bit. So I saw that happening in GDX, so I bought some calls in GDX. Why am I telling you this? And why wasn't it on the board for stocks on the move? Well, I thought about it, but here's the reason why. Because the intention of this trade is a swing trade. So it's not a day trade. It's not really meant for a day or two or three. It's meant for a longer term swing trade, probably weeks, if not more. Here's the weekly chart. If I'm right, and they basically came back to test what? A former breakout area. You knew I was going to say that. That was my number, $30.58, and guess what the low was yesterday? $30.64, but I saw the market turning, and I ended up buying some longer-term calls. Again, why am I telling you this? Because I've been getting a lot of emails for a long time requesting that I have a swing trade service. I've done it before, and I want to do it again. I'm set up to do it. I want to launch the service. It would be trades like this. This would be a good example. My apprehension always is the volume of emails and questions that I get. Are you still in the trade? Are you still in the trade? Are you still in the trade? And I say that from experience. That's really the apprehension, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'll deal with it at the time. Some of you won't believe that I actually bought the calls. So here's the position. I think this reflects the market value after Monday's close, not necessarily today. But this is right out of TradeStation. If you have TradeStation, this is the positions page. It's archaic, it's horrible, but this is what it is. There's other ways to look at it, but here's one way. The stuff that's blurred out is my account number and also other positions that are in this swing trading account. GDX, I bought the September 17, that's the expiration, 35 calls slightly out of the money, but I compensated the out of the money portion with the time portion. It's not a tremendous position, but it's a position, and it's indicative of the type of stuff that would be in the swing trades. There would be stocks, market calls, commodities, could be oil, could be silver, could be anything. It depends on the chart setup. I don't care what it is. If I'm right, and I have to be right first, but can this thing bounce up back into these moving averages? Yeah. Would the option go positive if it did that? Yeah, of course. Can it go higher than that? Of course. It will be dependent on gold. But you should get more juice out of GDX than you do out of buying or owning GLD. However, the caveat is the mining stocks can get thrown out with the bathwater in a market sell-off even at the same time gold can be rising. The metal itself can be rising but the stocks can be getting thrown out with the bathwater. That can happen, and it does happen. Remember we just had a conversation about retracements? Well, a third retracement would be about these moving averages. Half would be up here. So can it retrace half? Yeah, why not? This kind of stuff happens all the time. Did anybody want to own gold or GDX any time in the recent several weeks or even months? And the answer is no. Everybody was looking the other way. Nobody wanted it. Guess what? Why do you think I was looking down there? Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. We're going to pull the ripcord here. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.